thermodynamics. Versus kinetics, we're still referring here to the potential energy diagram. And their domains are different on the potential energy <coughs> diagram. The purple section refers to kinetics, and that was the pathway, the mechanism, the intermediates. Okay? Those are all the reaction rate, all part of that purple section. And yes, on your graph, you should label this would be the domain for the kinetics. We're going back to, because in October we already reviewed uh, some of the thermodynamics stuff. We're going back to thermodynamics, which happens to be the green shaded areas on the graph, referring to your reactants and your products. We kind of don't really care how it gets there. We don't care about the pathway or the rate. We just need to know the initial, we need to know the final, and we can take the difference to get the overall change. So that is what we're dealing with when we're talking about thermo. And today is going to be mainly a review of delta H from thermo already before we get into some of the other components that go with thermodynamics. Okay, so back on here to a uh, couple of definitions. Thermodynamics, we're referring to a reaction or a process, whether or not it's spontaneous. And what that means is, will it just occur on its own, outside any intervention, will it just happen? However, that doesn't mean that the process actually has to be a fast process. It can be slow like the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide just occurs on its own. So I found some old bottles of hydrogen peroxide to use for the, the lab at the beginning of the year, but I did have to go to the store and buy my own because after a couple of years, they naturally just decompose into oxygen and water and um, it just happens, okay? Same thing with rusting, okay? That's just a natural process. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does occur on its own. So we would consider that to be spontaneous. However, that word spontaneous is not to be used. Okay? That's how it used to be referred to in the past. In a free response question, when you're trying to explain and justify your answer, you want to not say it's spontaneous. You want to say it's thermodynamically favored. Use that phrase. Because there's actual free response uh, Keys from old AP exams where they tell you not to give them credit for writing spontaneous. So you would actually need to state that it is thermodynamically favored. Okay? Example here is that the ball rolls <coughs> down a hill. That's going to just happen, right? Gravity helps us out a little bit there. But could you get it to roll back up on its own without helping it? No, so that the reverse would not be spontaneous or favored in any way, okay? So that's what we're referring to when we're talking about um, whether a reaction is thermodynamically favored. And there are other things besides enthalpy that play a role here. We're not probably going to get to them today, but uh, we're reviewing enthalpy, which is one of the factors the other one, other major factor here is entropy, okay? So we're going to be looking at that next time. Now, a couple other things real quick uh, in referring to, uh, we'll get to that, yeah, okay. Going back to thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics we know, already know this one. We've heard this one over and over again. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It just exists. It is constant, and it changes form. There's lots of forms of energy. It changes form. So it's not created nor destroyed, and it is a constant value. So keep that in mind about the first law of thermodynamics.
that we describe the energy transfer using a couple of words that make up the universe. And what would we use to describe those words that make up the universe? What makes up the universe and how we can um, talk about energy and how it changes? System and surroundings. He is correct. Very good. The universe we describe as whether it's part of the system or is it part of the surroundings. You remember these wonderful terms from way back when. So we usually focus on how the heat is, uh, which way it's going from the system. But you can also interpret it from the surroundings perspective as well. Okay. So we have our universe. It's going to consist of the system and the surroundings. If we feel cold when touching an ice cube, the ice cube is absorbing, yes would be the best scientific term, absorbing the energy from your hand, from my hand, from our hand. And therefore, our hand is releasing the energy to the ice cube. Yes, giving is correct, but we use absorbing and releasing technically to be true. And then when you're using a thermometer to measure temperature, what perspective are you coming from, the sound surroundings or the system? It's always from the surroundings there. So if the temperature decreases, you know um, that the system is gaining energy, it's taking it from the surroundings. If the temperature increases, you know it's releasing heat to the surroundings, okay? So keep that in mind. Enthalpy, delta H, heat. A couple of perspectives here on enthalpy. Now, as stated before at the beginning, we're talking about the initial and final states here, not the pathway in between. We're just uh, caring about where we start and where we finish. Does anybody remember what that term's called? It is a what? It is a state function. He is correct. Remember the state function. We don't need to know the pathway and the intermediates and all the stuff in between. We just care about the beginning and the end. I don't care how you get there. Driving to the mall, remember you could have taken a bunch of different routes to get there. Just as long as you got there at the right time, the right place. Leaving from the, the same place, getting there. Okay. The other thing about delta H that we need to remember is what type of property is this? It would be extensive. What does that mean again? Depends on the amount, right? You burn a twig versus burning a log. Who's going to give off more heat? The one with the log, the bigger amount. This is an extensive property. Delta H is known as heat of reaction, and then you have different forms of it. You can have delta H of combustion, delta H of formation, which we're <laughs> going to review again. And yes, bless you. A bunch of different versions here. We have this nice way of calculating it. If we're going to calculate it this way, using the equation, where do we get those values? We need them from a table in the textbook or appendix. You would be given those values in the problem. Okay, you wouldn't have to memorize anything like that. You just would need to know how to use them. Okay. Oh, another thing to review, I'm sure you already know this, but if delta H is positive, it should be endothermic. <laughs> And if delta H was negative, we know it's exothermic. 
Okay. Lovely, wonderful things from back. Three ways to calculate. Delta H, in case you forgot. Hess's Law, our first one. Well, we're going to be reviewing those steps in a moment. Second one is using the equation. Given the values from the tables in the appendix. And then the last one that lots of people forget, which is probably the hardest, is the bond energy equations. Ah, the equation, excuse me. And that one's a little confusing, but we're going to work a couple problems with that as well. Okay, Hess's Law. You're going to have a series of steps, just like before, but do we remember how to do this and not confusing it with the one that applies to equilibrium, okay? So, what are the rules that apply to Hess's Law? What's the first thing you can do to one of the steps? You can do flipping it, yes, and what does that do? Flip the step. And what happens to delta H? We change the sign, because what if your sign was already negative to begin with? Then you would change it to positive. So you would change the sign. Now, that's one thing you can do in Hess's Law. What's the other thing you can do with the step? Multiply by multiplying factor or coefficient. And what happens to your delta H? If you multiply by a number, it would be multiplied by that same number. And now you have an example to do. The exponent ones would be for equilibrium and the reciprocal and multiplying. Because once you do, those are all the steps for the equilibrium one, yes. Here, you flip, you change the sign. Here, you multiply. You multiply the delta H by that number, and then you add these ones up. Remember, these are adding up. Not to get confused with the equilibrium version, where, yes, if it was, you would square it, or you'd raise it to the power, or if you flipped, you would reciprocal. Okay? We're not doing that here. This is Hess's Law. Follow these steps, and then make sure you just add them up at the end. Do not multiply them. Okay? And now you can work on that practice problem. Okay, so... Do we do anything to the first step? No. No, no we leave that one alone. second step. This one needs to flip and be very careful with your waters because you have two waters in different phases here. Try to flip it because we need the B2H6 over here on the product side. So I'm going to change the side over here Make that positive. What do we need to do to the next one? We need to multiply it by 3, right? Multiply this by 3, we need to multiply the delta H by 3. 3H2 plus 3 halves O2 gives us 3 of the liquid waters liquid water there. 
So the delta H over here becomes negative 858, right? And last but not least, what do we do to the last one? Multiply it by 3. So that gets multiplied by 3. So we have three of the liquid waters over here going to three of the gaseous waters. And this delta H ends up being 132. Now all you need to do is add them up. And you get a total of 36 kilojoules. Standard state. I believe you saw this on your midterm at one point too. A lot of people question it. The 298K is just the standard state temperature because it's 25 degrees Celsius. So if you add that to 273, you get your 298K. Um, for a solution though, your standard state is always considered one molar of the solution. And for a gas, that's exactly one atmosphere. And what is one atmosphere a measure of? Pressure where? At sea level. One atmosphere is the pressure of our atmosphere at sea level. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see this little um, circle notation there on delta S, delta H, and delta Gs, and that just means it's under standard conditions. So if you see that next to it, that just means it's applying to these standard conditions. Okay, so now we're going to be doing heats of formation again. Heats of formation, you can calculate from the appendices values, but we do have to remember something about the heat of formation. When you are doing heats of formation, what are you actually calculating here? It always is referring to what? A heat of formation should be how many moles of that particular substance? Going to one mole of that substance. So when you are writing out a reaction for a heat of formation, it should be forming that one substance, one mole of it from its elements. Remember, it's from its elements, okay? And this equation, yes, is small. I'll write it bigger. Delta H reaction, it has the little sigma signs that mean sum of. And then with the little p means the moles times each of the products from the balanced equation. Delta H, F of formation from the products, those values you get off the tables in the appendix. This subtracting the reactants here, same time, they get multiplied by their moles from the balanced equation as well. Okay, so this means sum. Of course, the n values are the moles from the balanced equation. So to answer the next question, Elements in their natural state have a value of blank for their heats of formation. That would be zero. They don't have an amount because they already exist in nature as is. They haven't been formed from something. They just exist that way. Okay? Yes. 
So we're going to now write out the reaction for the heat of formation of iron three oxide. So you're going to be forming iron three oxide over here. So what should go in front of the iron three oxide of that part of the equation? A1 here, just remember this always has to be one mole of that. So we're forming it from the elements. The two elements involved here is iron and oxygen. Don't forget oxygen is a diatomic there. And so when we try to balance this, what do we need to use? Two for the iron, but what do you have to use for the oxygen then? have to use a fraction. This is the only time when you use the fraction of, uh, for the coefficients, when you have to make it equal to one mole of the formation here, okay? So now, quickly, using the values um, in the next problem, on the next page, go ahead and calculate the formation, heat of formation for iron three oxide. So, when calculating this, I'm sure you figured it out very quickly. Products minus reactants. You have one, is it, it negative 891? 826. 826, wrong one then. 826. That would be like in the first bracket. Technically, you're doing delta H. Okay, you would still multiply the 2 times the 0 for the iron and the 3 halves times the 0. But we all know that this part of the equation is just going to drop off. So it ends up being negative H26 kilojoules per what? Don't forget the unit here, kilojoules per mole. Because it's out of moles, not out of grams, but out of moles. Because it's extensive, remember, it's about the amount here. All right, a few little review things, too, about bonds. Since we're going to be talking about bond energy, everybody remembers that a single bond is one pair of electrons, correct? That would be Lewis dot structures coming into play soon, too, yes. Double bonds are two pairs, triple bonds are three pairs, okay? But I'm not sure if you remember this from last year. The single bonds are the longest. Triple bonds are the shortest. So that also correlates to bond strength. Triple bonds are the strongest. And single bonds are the longest, so they're the easiest to break, so they're, they're weaker. And if you count up the bonds, then you can end up getting bond order, which we'll talk about in Unit 7 when we do do Lewis dot structures, electron configurations, all that fun molecular geometry stuff. Okay? However, there is a correlation between the bond strength and the bond energy. The stronger the bond, what should happen to your energy? The more energy needed to break that bond. Okay? The more energy in that bond. So you'll notice when we do the bond energy examples, the ones that are doubles and triples, their values are going to be higher in amounts than stuff that has single bonds. Okay? So bond strength is related to energy. Stronger bonds have more energy in them. That means you need more energy to break them. Okay? So here's the equation. Don't forget that bond breaking it requires energy as an endothermic process. Bond formation releases energy as an exothermic process. But when we state an overall reaction as exo or endothermic, it, it has to really do with the overall net. Because in each reaction, you're going to have bonds breaking and bonds forming. But which one is higher? will give you the overall reaction. So if bond breaking takes more energy, 
and it's, then it's going to be endothermic. If bond re formation releases more energy, you're going to have an exothermic overall reaction. But both of them occur in a reaction. It just depends on which one's more as to how the overall reaction would come out. This equation, though, is where people get confused because it's the only one that's different from the rest. Bonds broken, that's energy required. That's the endothermic, but that takes place in the reactants. So here you're really looking at the bonds of the reactants. Energy releasing is forming the new bond, so really you're looking at the bonds of the products. And you saw the other equation, the delta H was the H products minus H reactants. This is the one where it's reversed. And everybody has a tendency to forget that it's reactants minus the products here. And delta S and delta G, when we get to it, are also going to follow the same pattern of pro products minus reactants. So this will be the only one that should be different and reversed. Okay? And they should give you the bond energies in the problem if they're asking you to do this. Another thing you should also realize about the future free responses coming your way is that now that you have a bunch of units done, they can have part A be a kind of a kinetics take on the energy diagram. Part B can be a thermo delta H problem. And then part C and D can go into some of the other delta S. Delta G can even evolve you back into electrochemistry. So a lot of these free responses that you're going to start to see are going to be merging a lot of concepts. Okay. So, let's take a look at this one. And because we haven't done those dot structures, letting you know that nitrogen, if you forgot, and nitrogen forms a triple there, which is the other diatomic that's not a single. Oxygen's a double, good, you got that, okay. But um, what you really want to do with these types of problems is draw them out if you can't visually see them. So we do have the one nitrogen over here, triple. But here we're going to have three HH bonds. And that's going to take us over here to ammonia. Does everybody remember how to draw ammonia? And gives you how many valence electrons? Five is correct. I think I heard a five out there. And how many does H bring in there? There's three of them, and they all bring in one, so that's three. So we have a total of eight. Who goes in the middle? Nitrogen. Nitrogen does. So you attach the ligands here. How many did I use? Six gone, I have two left. Who still needs two to be satisfied with the octet? And we put the dots on, and there you go. You have your ammonia. But we do have two of them, so you need to draw them twice. Okay? So once you do that, you have an idea of how many you need to multiply by. So if I'm dealing with our nitrogen right here, that would be 1 nitrogen times my uh, 941. Okay, this is going towards our delta H. Those bonds need to be broken. Plus, I have three here of my hydrogens. So I need to multiply that by three. And the hydrogen bond is 432. Now I'm going to subtract over here. How many NH bonds do we have? So if you look over here, yes, there's six N to H bonds. So we're going to do six times our N to H, 391s, and you can calculate your delta H. And this comes out to being Anyone? Negative 109 kilojoules per mole.
Okay, C3H3 is actually called an alkene, and I know that we all spent one day on organic and maybe got a packet, and that's about it. Yes. Okay. Has a double bond in it, has a bunch of DCH groups. So this is called the structural formula here, drawn like this. Basically, what it's showing you is that the C is attached to two H's, and then it's double bonded to this C over here. This C is double bonded, but it has only one H attached to it because it's bonded also to that C. And then um, over here, the N group is called a methyl group. It's a C with three H's attached to it, and so <coughs> forth. Now, we can structurally draw all of these and cancel them out as we go. We did just draw ammonia right here, so that's pretty easy. And the oxygen over there, we can draw out pretty easy. We know that one's just a double bonded one. Down here, we are going to have, once again, CH2 groups double bonded to a C over here. You still see there's a CH here with a CH here bonded. And then something new has happened. You have the C to the triple N over here, triple bonded to the N over there, okay? And then our six waters. You do see some things overlapping here that are not changing. So if it's in the reactants and also in the products, they kind of cancel each other out. And you don't need to use them in the calculation, okay? So here, if we cancel those, could I, no C to H's, the C to the, the double bond, we don't need that one anymore, because that cancels, this H cancels out too, okay? So we don't need the C to C bonds either when you're doing your calculations. But they might throw them in there to throw you off a little bit, and then you add in extra numbers, which you would still get the same answer if you calculated them on both sides. It just would take longer. So let's go ahead and calculate this. Finish this one out, and we'll start entropy next class. So, delta H, this is reactants minus products. So we have three, no, six, got to add them up from both, six of the C to H's, right? So that would be six times four, 13, plus six of my N to H's, 391s, plus my one oxygen, 95 in the first bracket. Subtracting out the product. In that case, we only have two of our C to N's here. 891s plus our 12 of our O to H's, right? So there's six, but there's two in each water molecule. So that would be a total of 12. So when you calculate, yes, it's, it gets to be a very long problem. When I do these problems, what I always do is make sure I find a total for this side when they're really long and a total for the other side, okay, so that you can make sure you get the right answer. And this ends up, of course, being exothermic if you were to look at the negative sign on that. 